Hi guys, so this video is for any one of you that are still concerned about just drawing anything digitally or just drawing in general, whether it's on the computer or on the page, this video is for you. So if you wanna stick around for about 45 minutes to an hour watching this, um, I think that you might find it very informative because you're going to learn uh, how to use this program and by extension, learn a little bit about just basic drawing tips that everyone would uh, should be able to pick up and know a little bit about uh, when you're making your own work. So here we are in Autodesk Sketchbook Pro, and here you see the workspace area. So very nice. And we have in the bottom left, we have this little puck area that lets you know that there are things that you can click on. Um, you can check out different colors. You can uh, check out things that we're not going to check out right now. Um, you can also, you know, play with the appearance, you know, of your uh, puck over here. Let me see. Yeah, you could turn it on and off. You can bring it to the side. You know, just follow the directions of, like, say, if I want to have this lagoon on the left, you can hover over. You can hover over it and see. It tells you where it's going to go, so you can play around with where you want this to show up. You know, you can have it like this again. You have it as a bar, but I want it as the full bar right here. So you can play around with, you know, pulling and, you know, clicking and dragging, I should say, on it to make sure that it's working for you. Uh, or, you know, where you wanna have that located. So right here, and let's see, I want to start by showing you the four different property windows that you're gonna need to have open. Uh, well, you know, for starters, I kept this blank over here, so uh, you would just see the workspace area to begin with. But what if I wanted to bring up those four windows and I didn't see them? This is what I would do. I would go to my top menu, and in my top menu, I would go to window. When I go to window, the first thing that I want is I want to be able to see my layers. So let me go to my layer editor. Here is my layer window or editor. I also want to be able to see my different um, tools. So let's go to Windows again. And let's go to Toolbar. Well, that's not the toolbar that I want, but it's one that we'll get to know. So go to Window again, and let's see Brush Palette. Or is it, yeah, Brush Palette, yeah. Here we go. So brush palette brings up all of your different nibs that you can use, including your eraser, your sharpen tool to sharpen your images, or you can smudge them or blur them or have a soft eraser. Some of these other really cool ones include the airbrush. Uh, here's a big old paintbrush that you can bring really large uh, to make all kinds of really cool um, strokes but I generally keep my sketching to my pencil tool and my inking pen tool to clean things up. So it's a little bit of going between these. And I add some tone using my airbrush tool. It looks like that. It's called it the air, yeah, it is the airbrush tool. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, what I want to talk about is again, basic drawing through Sketchbook Pro and vice versa. So you actually learn something about both going in two different directions, you know? So I'm gonna change my color over here because it's set to a flesh tone. So yes, you learn basic drawing in Sketchbook Pro, but Sketchbook Pro, you get to learn basic drawing from. So let's dive in. We should do that. Hold on one sec. 
get rid of my squiggle over here. And just what we're talking about, layers. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, layers, we have three areas, three different kinds of layers that you can use when storyboarding anything uh, in Sketchbook Pro. The first is you're gonna wanna have a rough layer. In your rough layer, you're gonna work out your basic construction for a character or an object like a car. In the same rough layer, you can also work out um, acting, basic acting. You can rough out uh, an entire scene, uh, an entire environment or master shot, the camera trajectory, everything in a rough layer. But then in the second layer that goes above it, you can add uh, a more refined approach. You can clean up layers. You can clean up characters that you were roughing in that you don't want the characters to look like, you know, pieces of smushes of bubble gum running across the screen. Uh, you know, your rough layers, you want to be able to have, you know, maximum amount of clarity and sometimes having a cleaner drawing helps to that end. So that's what I mean by clean layers. Uh, you can also refine a pose, you know, because nothing's written in stone with a rough layer. And it's just a skeleton guide. So your clean layer is really where it's at and you'll be able to define that more once you're on that clean layer. But you'll also be able to add little bits of tone and mood while using say the airbrush tool. Uh, if you so need to use something like that, but it's not required that you need to have uh, tone with a you know airbrush look to it. Uh, it's really cosmetic. And so the third would be color layers. And the only reason why you would use color layers in film storyboards, where primarily the characters and backgrounds and everything, information, visual information is in black and white, is because you'd like to be able to give clear color-coded information for your cinematographer, namely your arrow directions, say a character walking in and off a screen, a car moving in and off a screen, uh, off the screen. Uh, also camera framing, like say you want to be able in the master shot that's wide, you want to show that you originally want to start uh, with a much tighter framing. You can do that within the master shot setup sketch by making a red frame layer for your camera frame. Uh, that's, you know, roughly the size of the camera dimensions of, you know, 1980 by 10, no, was it 1080 by 1920? for widescreen high definition resolution. So yeah, so it'd be more like a you know, you know, rectangle like you're looking at right now in the workspace. So that's where you're going to learn a lot about drawing is from your understanding of layers. So let's take a look at layers. Let me turn off this layer and go to a special group of layers. This is a group over here that I have. There's another group. This is the one that we want. It's called layers. I'm going to turn it on. And so let's take a quick look. I know we took a very brief look in class, but this is a little bit more scaled back. Let's take a closer look at what composes any one of these layers that you're looking at. So uh, when you're looking at a layer, you know, for one thing, make sure that you're tapping on it so that it's highlighted in blue so that you can make sure that that is the layer that you indeed have selected. Uh, the layer comes with a name by default. It's usually just called layer, whatever it is in the stack in order. In this case, it was 10. But you see one, two, three, four, five, and six ultimately things that you want to be able to know about. The first thing is this is to turn your layer on and off to make it visible or invisible to the viewer. Uh, there's another way of going about that, but we'll take a look at that in a moment. You can also color code your layers. How you see I have mine color coded right here. I can easily go to that layer or any layer and click on that and press and hold. And I can say, hey, I want it to be green. It's now green. And so is everything inside of that grouping. Again, we'll talk about what group layers are later on, or just in a, in a minute. 
And so um, there are other things. Here's your opacity for a layer. So let me turn this layer off. You already know where that is. So that's turn my layer off. And so let me turn this layer on. This is the layer that you were accustomed to from the end of our class today. So uh, if I want to play around with the opacity, I can go to that layer and I can drag on this little blue slider and bring it all the way down to zero or bring it all the way back up again or midway, but it's all up to you. So it's good to know where your opacity uh, control is. The other one is to know about your locking a layer. You, know, you just wanna make sure that what if you're working on other layers and then you accidentally realize, oh my goodness, I'm working on this layer that I don't wanna work on. In order to avoid that, you can easily lock you know, your layer. You can see that when I tapped on it, I tapped it again, it opened, tap it again, and it locks. And so I can't do anything to that layer. If I try to draw on it, nothing happens. So I open it again, and now I can draw all on top of it. Uh, another thing is seeing these, uh, this up and down arrow, if I hover over it, it says to reorder layers. An important thing to know about reordering layers in Sketchbook Pro is to know that it's not completely easy. If you click and drag up and just release, you know, haphazardly without really, you know, taking stock of where you're clicking and dragging to, it will snap it not back to where it was originally, it will snap it back down to the bottom of the stack just above the background. So just know that that may happen. So what I like to keep in mind is that when I click and drag up, I'm trying to bring this up here successfully. I want to bring it up here and I'm going to hold it towards the center and boom, see it knocked it right back down to the bottom. So it's still a little tricky. Let's get up there, bring it up a little bit more. Yeah, disco, it worked. So Clicking and dragging up, you know, and to the left will help you. So I'm going to click and drag to the left, and now I've successfully clicked and dragged it down. So just use that little up and down icon to click and drag your, your layers up and down along the stacking hierarchy. Let's turn this off, come back again. All right, so when I click and drag in any of these windows, if you look to my far right, I'm clicking and dragging it's the same way as what you're looking at in the center of the screen. So when I do that, when I click and drag, I can click and drag kind of like a, like a clock dial around and pick something. And so when I click and drag around, these are what my different options are. I can create a new layer right here. And the reason why you see that my it's a little anti sign is because this layer is, you know, um, I'm on the wrong layer. So here we are. But also because I'm on a grouped layer, so I can't draw on a group. So that's why it's a little anti sign. So don't worry about that. But if I'm right here, clicking and dragging uh, in the center of this little dotted circle, I can go to this icon of a page with a plus sign, a green plus. That's to make a new layer. Uh, you can also make a new layer by going right over here to the very top left of your layer uh, window and pressing on add new layer or add layer. You can also go here to your layer menu and click new layer. You can also, uh, I believe the hotkey is either command shift L or command L. Command L I know works for me, but I may have set it for myself in the preferences. We'll talk about preference shortcuts later, but there are not a lot of them, but you can do uh, set, you can set certain preferences uh, for layers and such uh, in Sketchbook Pro. Uh, moving back into this center control uh, dial, uh, we have, you can move in clockwise, you can delete a layer, with a little X, seems very self-explanatory. You can click to your immediate right and you can, you know, um, you can uh, rename a layer. You can also click and drag down to merge a layer down, but that's 
just one layer, or you can click and drag on this one right here. And as you can see, there's three pages, you can get three layers underneath. So the one that you've selected and then two more layers underneath will be selected to merge together. We'll see what that looks like later on. Uh, here's another option for locking your uh, layer. And here is another option for uh, hiding your layer. So there you go. You see they're actually next to each other if you click and drag out. And here is lastly uh, the layer for, um, uh, well, the option to duplicate your layer. So, uh, and if you rename your layer by clicking to your immediate, clicking and dragging to your immediate right, you can, a little dialog box will pop up, you can rename it, and then it will be reflected in the name after you hit enter. Uh, and the name of your layer will be now renamed. So that's a uh, one part of it, but let's take a look at what's happening up here. We're not gonna mess around with checking out the pass through, you know, you know, drop down menu because there's all kinds of different effects that I don't want to confuse you with right now. Uh, confuse you later. <laughs> but uh, besides meeting the plus sign up here that adds another way is another way of adding a layer, uh, a new layer. Here we can add a group. We can make a new group layer, a folder. We can also bring in images. We can import images. Um, and we can also clear a frame. And on the far right, you've already met the layer menu, which gives you a very, you know, list, uh, you know, ish version uh, of everything. So uh, let's take a look at add image. I can click on add image and I can bring in uh, a comic that I've been working on. No, I can't do that. Here it is. No, I can't work on that, can I? No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in an embarrassing picture of my brother and I in 1979 for Christmas. And so here it is. I'm going to now be faced with what happens when you import an image for the first time. You'll see that the image is larger than it needs to be. It needs to be scaled down. But luckily, by default, when you import an image, you're going to have this little highlighted pop. You can see that as I hover over it with my arrow, with my uh, mouse arrow that wherever I go with the mouse arrow, it highlights it in blue. And so there's certain things I can do um, when I concentrate on a certain area and click and drag. So if I click and drag in, that makes things go inward. And if I click and drag out, it'll make it go outward. That's a good way to think about anything that you do here. So I'm gonna first play around with the scale. So in the very center, you can see that there's a big square, little square. That's a nice way of thinking about scaling. Click and drag in, and now I can have that to that size. Now I can also go to this particular um, little um, section or button, and that one is to skew or distort my image that I've brought in. And so if I click and drag to the right, it will make it wide. And if I click and drag to the left, it will, you know, thin out the image. Also, I can rotate the image. And also, I can move the image by clicking and dragging anywhere, you know, clicking and dragging anywhere I want to go in the workspace. And you'll notice uh, that once again, this gray area, it dips out. It's like a ma like a permanent uh, mask that is hard coded into the interface of Sketchbook Pro. So uh, just once again, understand that anything that you draw outside of here will not be shown. And so is there anything else that I'd like to show you on here? No, I can just hit the X button. And now that image is there, but now I can still move it around because all I have to now do is hit V. 
the default puck that I got in the center was just to have immediate control of what I wanted to do with the image. But now I can just hit V like with any other, you know, um, layer and move it around, or I could just hide it. So that's one way, that's the way to bring in a image. Um, if I didn't like what was on a layer, I'm gonna to go to this layer right here. If I didn't like what was on a layer, I would go to that layer, click to make sure I'm highlighting it in blue. And I can go right here to clear and it goes away, Command Z. Because another way of doing it is with your hotkey, which is to simply hit the delete key and it goes away. So uh, let's go back to layers. Anything else I'd like to talk about with layers? No, I think that's actually about it with layers because now that we understand more about layers, what you're going to do or what I'm going to do is show you guys uh, by making a new layer, I'm gonna create a character for the first time and I'm gonna make a rough layer first. So my rough layer is gonna be made with a blue color. And I can also bring up my color editor. One thing I wanted to point out before I get to drawing is that uh, I have two icons. And if you are not seeing, look all the way to your bottom left corner. And you're gonna see along this little puck that I'm gesturing over, this little lagoon as they call it, um, there are two little dots underneath of it. If I hover over the first one, it says current tool. That's the uh, ink pen that I have right here. And if I hover at the bottom, there is my current color that I have selected. If I wanna bring up my color editor, all I have to do is press on that. And here it is. So now I can check out all the different colors. You can, you know, uh, you know, uh, pick different colors to your heart's desire and mix and match them. Very fun. We'll take a deeper dive into um, playing around with colors later on. But again, most film storyboards are in black and white, so it's not a giant concern for you guys. Uh, so now I want to choose a, bl a blue color. Yeah, which I had already. There we go. And I'm going to talk about something that's very important when you think about constructing anything in storyboards, in drawing in general. You know, don't get hung up in the pretty pictures. Uh, the pretty pictures uh, came about through lots of hard work and what's called rough layers. So uh, basic construction is what you should be thinking about. Think in terms of shapes or basic shapes, oblong or distorted shapes. Um, and also think of a circle and a line. Those two things are the basis for build, the building blocks of drawing any character, say for instance. If you're drawing any person, those are the two things that I would start with. Not They would be next to each other, on top of each other, but that's just how graphically simple it is for me to start drawing anyone. The circle I would call the head, obviously. And this would be not just the body of my stick figure, because that's what we're gonna start with, but it's known in animation as the line of action. That's your spine of your character. And so the more that I bend that body and keep a, you know, the lollipop head on top, that is as far as the body is gonna be able to bend, if you think about it. And you can see how I, kind of completed the pose right here with my stick figure by just doing that. And you could see that he's lively already. So let's try that using a circle and a line. I'm gonna, he's like a, I'm gonna make him into a magician, <laughs> a kid magician maybe. 
you can see I'm figuring out we're using command Z until I get the right line that I'd, I'd like to use. Um, be very friendly with command Z. You're going to know each other for a while if you're using this program. And so I'm just going to go in a little bit further. And the first thing that I want to do is complete this line of action. And so as we were pointing out before, that's the leg that's at rest. I want to find the balance leg now. So I'm just going to bring this down like a little V, upside down tri or triangle or upside down V. And so now I'm going to add a straight line across just to find my balance for my character. It's always important to find balance. I'm going to make a little circle here just to say that's my placeholder for where I want joints to be. Joints are just going to be represented as little circles throughout the body. So little joint circles for the shoulders, for the kneecaps. I can even add his knees in right now. I'm going to say this is just going to be a kid because the head's a little big. I'm not liking it. I like to splay out the legs a little bit too. So no, you know what? I'm not going to uh, be a stickler about things. So <laughs> I have my own standards. So you can see here what I'm doing naturally without even thinking about it. Uh, so I'm backing up, is that the next thing that I want to do is start setting out the guidelines for the next basic shape that I'm going to add, which is the trunk of the body. So I'm leaving a little bit of separation between the circle and the neck area that I want to set out. And so that's the you know, horizontal line that defines the shoulder. And here is the line that, saw, that defines the bottom of the torso. And maybe this one will define the pelvis region. And this one will define the kneecaps and legs. Automatically, I think I want to make his legs longer, just looking at it. And just thinking about that makes me say, you know what? I don't have to start the drawing over again. All I have to do is hit my M key for marquee again, or my mask tool and hold down V and then click and drag down. And there you go. So I'm going to press on my um, tool again over here, my pen tool to make sure that it's activated. Sometimes it loses recognition when you press the marquee tool. And so now I can say my knees are about right over here. That's nice. And so, you know, that's about when I look at anybody, that's about where these things would be, you know, these areas of the body would be designated. So I'm going to make a simple um, uh, uh, line down. And make, you know, an oblong shape of a upside down rectangle or something like that. And so now I can figure out making another one over here. Check that out. Now he has a little bit of hip right here. This could be designating the back of the leg. But as I'm following the trajectory of him, I'm saying, oh, that's not very natural. I think that a foot could actually come out here. So you can see I'm revising myself in real time. And it's especially good to see that I have my guideline at the bottom to tell me that. So I can now go and just erase that with my eraser tool. So I can get to refine things as I go. So now, and so later on, I can just, you know, I can say, I'll make that nice and foreshortened right there. But for now, let's concentrate on building the rest of the character. So I'm following this line of action through. And I'm going to give him like a ta-da kind of arms. That's why I'm thinking of a magician kid. So I'm making two little circles over here, just inside the silhouette. This one's kind of breaking it because he's on, like that's going to designate his shoulders. And so right from the point, pointy end, I'm just going to radiate, radiate out a line or two to say those are his hands, his arms, I should say. And so when I get you know, up to what I feel is a comfortable bicep, I just do that. Add a little circle here. 
and then I'm going to make a longer line and designate what would define arms. Now, because his hands are going to be cut off, I'm going to need to drag him down. So just to drag the entire image down, I'll hold down V and just bring it down. There you go. Let's continue. So now all I'm going to do is just to designate his arms or his hands is this is this joint for the wrist. That's where that would begin. And so now I can overlap just a little bit on top of it, a, another similar shape of this rectangle for the hands. And it's just a little guide marker over here. It's a little bit of a flatter one because his hand will lay flat. It's a good thing to think about the pose that you make before you make it to sketch it out, but that's not the purpose of this video. So uh, I'm going to move in a little closer. And now I want to designate a little bit of a, about his face. So I'm going to wrap a line around the circle. Imagine a line that goes around that circle. And now I'm going to do the same going with my longitude line over here. Just very basic construction lines. And so if you can imagine then, now I've started to you know, do something like that. You know, I've made that cross T. So, you know, you see it all the time in really cool drawings about construction and drafting. That's all that it is, is just a designation for eyes on one side and the eye on the other. You know, designated what a, you know, where the nose will go and where the mouth will go. And so later on, you can then start, you know, ghosting in another oval right here that will define the rest of the face because that ball of the circle is not truly supposed to be, you know, all of the head unless you mean it to be. You can see how I'm starting to form the face and I'll make a few more revisions, but in the cleanup. But now you can see how I'm starting to build on top, I'm giving a little bit of contrast and all that you're gonna see me doing to add a bit of, you know, to add more meat onto the bone, so to speak, is all I'm gonna do is I'm following these guidelines that I set down in blue and in the red, I'm going on either side of each line and I'm adding a bit of contrast in the lines. One line is curvy, one is a little bit straight. And so I'm adding a little bit more heft to them, you know, a little bit more solid as a character. I can think about where, you know, that line of action is, but I can also then think about where his chest would be if this is his back, this would be his chest. And so this would be the line that defines, I'm going around to say that's his chest area. So that would be his rib cage. If you, it's always good to study a bit of anatomy. So I'm just gonna make a little oval right there to designate that. And so I'll say that's fine. It's all right, it's like a little, little gumdrop of an oval in the center in the center at the front. And so now I'm just playing around with the edges over here. There's more edges on the silhouette, I should say. And so now I'm thinking his, you know, now I start when I get to just draw in the, you know, crotchal region, I can now start to think about this as the back or side of his leg, which would feel a lot more natural. So I can draw like a straight line even just ghost one down and see where truly should his leg be. And so that's the joint of his ankle. And one nice abbreviation that I've always found for making a foreshortened foot going towards us, and it comes from comic books I learned it as a kid, is making like a diamond, like that, just make a diamond as your rough. 
and you just generate a line out from that. It looks like a fountain pen, it looks like this actually. And so later on, I'll go in and I'll play around with it. You'll see what I'll do with it. And so now I'm just forming a leg and I'm making a joint. I know there's his knees are right here. I'm following just a more, you know, contrast line work over here. See how this is a little straighter. This is a little bumpier and flared to it. And now I can do that to say that's gonna be his foot. And I can say, oh, okay, they're about the same size. I'll do a little bit of measuring. You don't have to get that fancy schmancy. But you can see that somebody is starting to take shape over here. And I can also designate some underwear to think about the character beneath. And again, you don't have to think that far. This is just really just given some basic drawn tips of constructing any character. Let's move in a little closer. And now using this little ball, I can say that's a shoulder. See a little bump right here, that's a shoulder. And again, thinking of that contrast in line on one side, and then this one will loop out with the other. Or maybe I could even make it a little bumpier like that. And now I know that I have an elbow I can add. So I'm just gonna make a little, a little diamond to the elbow. We go sit in. And you can see how I'm doing that right here. It's just, I'm just following the guideline with a little center line going to it. You know, and that'll connect to that arm, into that hand. And I want to bring it in a little bit more. So I'm even thinking about sliding that rectangle down. And I can also add a little mitten. That'll be the basis or the guide for my cleanup for my hand. And that arm looks huge. So let me use my L, my lasso tool, hold down V, I can skew it, make it smaller, and squatter, there you go. And go back to my pen. And let me rotate the canvas so I can catch a better line. And I can already see that this arm is a little too long. So I'm revising on the fly. Make that mitten hand. Let's bring that around, hold down my space bar, bring it back up. So now we have somebody that we can clean up. Let me just indicate where his ears will go. I'm following around the center over here. Is, you know, this will be a nice guide to his ears. And let's think about his hair, just a general outline of his hair. And I said I was gonna make him into a magician, so I can even rough in a little bit of that too. So let's say I want to put a hat on him. I'm just gonna rough in the idea of a hat. You know, how it would look around both sides. And I know the hats sort of have that little bean dip, you know, right over here to the circle, especially at this angle. And so I'm even following the trajectory of his spine to think about where the top of that basic shape for the hat would go. And then I bring it down over the sides of his face because I know that you know the hat should look like it actually sits on his head. So it shouldn't just look like it's just there. So you can see that it's kind of like flush with his face, you know, the, the contours of his face. And so lastly, I'll just give a little indication for my cleanup of his ta-da, you know, his cape. And 
Let's see what else. Um, I would love to draw a little bit more. We'll do that in another video. But for now, let's clean up our drawn here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down the opacity on this layer. So it mimics the old style uh, of animation, which was to use a light table. Back in the day, you had a little drafting table called a light table, for those who don't know. And you had in the center of it a circle. And that circle has a removable disk called a light disk. And in the center of that circle is a square. That square has a, um, a bit of fog glass, a square of fog glass in it. And so on the inside of the drafting table, the light that shines up, you place the disk on top and the light shines through the fog glass. You can register your pages on top of that fog glass. And so, you know, this is the digital equivalent of doing that just by bringing down your transparency and then saying, hey, I want to make a new layer on top. Here, I'm going to make a new layer right here. And so now I can pick a black color and I'm going to move in a little closer and start doing some quick cleanup work. I'm gonna start with his hat, obviously. It's very quick to go for. And when I clean up, I don't, you know, Command Z is gonna be your friend as you obviously, I'm able to start a line over and over again, really, really fast. Command Z, uh, my hand is always poised on it when I'm cleaning up or drawing. So uh, now I'm realizing as I draw, you know, it's always a good thing to try to go, you know, as fast as you can when it comes to storyboards. Uh, you don't want to, you know, overdo it. You don't want to make them look too pretty, but you can if you want to. But it's not, you know, the main focus. You see, I'm using my eraser tool so I can bring some of this here to overlap in front. So now I can do that. And you can see how I'm able to figure all of that out from my plan that I've already set out. And I'm just following the contours of what I'm looking at. And I can also adjust. You can see that the kid's face is not going to end up looking like what I started out with. So it's just a guide. And so now I can add a bit of this cape. I'm just trying to think about the wrapping of that. And so now let me think about his clothes you know, or his body over here. And you can see that I'm just gonna just flare out a little bit more from what I already did. I'm gonna make it that he's wearing one of those weird sweater vests. <laughs> Yeah, but now I can, now that you see that I have this little center line over here for his chest, now I just can leave a believable bit of, you know, um, you know, strokes that say, hey, that's fabric right there, where that bit of, you know, body sh is. Let me make this a little wider over here. And again, you see that I'm just following the contours of what I set out. I'll save the hands for last. And if you'll notice when I do the joint areas, that's where I add like 
the most minimal amounts of line strokes to indicate, you know, bend and fold in cloven. You can see by my style over here, everybody develops their own style, but I add like a little bit of edge for things to make a quick abbreviation. Everyone will find um, their own rhythm or own style, but um, it comes from just doing it a lot. And so let's concentrate on these legs. Very quick abbreviations along the silhouette of the character. And I'm just going off of what I also know about how legs look and making that thick to thin look over here. Again, you see the ends, I'm adding little folds and even a little indication of knees. That's his knee at the side view. Let's bring this down. There you go. And now you can see I'm going to clean up this little diamond foot over here. Because now I can add that in there to give that indication that there's a bit of an incline of the foot in perspective. And then finish that out. And now I could kind of mask up over on top of it by adding what I know about how shoelaces go. <laughs> and a little bit of sole. That's a foot. And we'll talk a lot about drawing feet and hands, you know, a subject near and dear to my heart or my misery, because, you know, uh, most artists will, professional artists will tell you that drawn hands and feet are the banes of their existence. So uh, if this looks like I'm drawing them a little too good to you too quickly, um, number one, they're not by my estimation. <laughs> number two, uh, it only if they do come across looking as you know really quickly made and looking good to you, it's only because I've done it a million times uh, and practice a lot at it. So um, especially hands, hands are the toughest ones. But that's why I start with what we call the mitten technique, because now with the mitten technique, I can say and I'm going to start up here, but I'm going to drag this hand down because it's a little too long or far apart from his wrist area. But using the thumb first. Uh, no, I'll use the pinky first because the pinky connects to uh, the meat of the palm or at least one part of the meat of the palm. And I can just make that line right there. Once I do that, I can make a little line across and now I know the tops of all of my fingers. And once I do that, I know that my middle finger will be the longest and that the other fingers around it will be sh just slightly shorter. And so now knowing that, I can make the other part of the meat of the palm with a little curve to show a, hand, a little thumb and then bring down the other side of the meat of the palm and then kind of connect it and finish it and then connect these. And so now all I need to do is grab my lasso tool and grab and press V and click and drag down as I'm holding down V and I can really fix it. Now you can see that I lost some of the quality of the resolution of the drawing. Part of what I can do to fix that is to do this, go back over it, try to bolden it a little bit more. But the best solution is to do what Sketchbook Pro added here to sort of help that with a sharpen tool. You know, but sometimes it could be a little too sharp. So I'm gonna bring this down. You know, I'm just pressing on my uh, open bracket and close bracket key. I mean, that's as good as it's going to get in this program when you're trying to sharpen things. And when you pull back, you're not going to really see that too much. You know, so it's all good. So let's finish out this character over here. And I'm going to rotate, holding down my space bar. I'm going to rotate the canvas just a little bit. And so now start with the pinky again. Make that line across. A little too much line across. 
Oops. And let's finish out that cape. I'll just go off of what I know from drawing Superman as a kid. <laughs> now that would be closer if I'm following the trajectory. It would actually be more like this. Ta-da! Magician boy. And so all I have to do now is just turn off my pan, my rough panel. Now, yes, we spoke about the idea of having color layers to um, express arrows and camera fields. But one thing that you're gonna need a color layer for with black and white characters is that you're going to, well, I'll just make a quick example of it of why you're gonna need a bit of color in here. I'm gonna make a new layer below. I'm gonna choose red, my M for marquee, drag a square over, and I'm gonna paint really fast using my paintbrush, really quick. Command D to deselect, and you see my immediate problem. He's see-through. See so if you imagine if he's going to have a background or something like that in the back of him, which he most likely will, well, he will in the next video, um, or for anything that you're drawing, you're gonna to wanna to have a background, other elements in the scene. You don't wanna have uh, you know, that distraction of you know, a character with nothing filled in on the inside. So a quick way to do that, you have two options. So, in discussing them, first of all, I'm gonna turn this down because it's a little too hot, but you can still get the point of seeing how this is, you know, now we can see what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna make a new layer on top of this red layer. And now I'm just gonna choose white. My first option is to say, I can bring my nib up over here. I double tap and I can bring it up double tapping on it, I can go to properties. I can bring it up large and just start coloring inside of him. And it won't bother the ink layer, of course, command Z. The way that I usually do it is uh, by holding down shift and my L key for lasso. Um, but I don't have to hold on the L key just to get the lasso on. I'm just gonna hit L. So here I can see that that has activated my shape contours uh, tools. And so uh, I know that my uh, lasso tool can act just like my marquee or my oval tool. And the oval tool is really neat if you're making comic books uh, you know, uh, speech bubbles and stuff like that. So that's when it's really helpful. But I'm just using my L tool on this new layer and I'm gonna go in and I'm going to move along the edges, not the edges, I'm moving, like you can see that I'm going through the center of these lines, these cleanup lines. I'm just moving all around. And now you might say to yourself, well, what happens when my hand gets tired of doing that? And I gotta go to another section of the artwork to loop out. The quick answer is you don't have a problem with that. All you have to do is use your space bar, move out a little bit. You can see that your, de your selection is still visible. And so now all you're gonna do is hold down shift and continue, but make sure that you're holding down shift while you're making this selection, the second selection, because if you do, 
it will lose that selection. So you can see it's not perfect. I'm not completely in the lines, but I can always go back and erase those portions that I don't need. There you go. So I'm just moving over and holding down shift again. All right, almost there. All right. Oops. I'm still holding down shift for each new selection that I'm making. And now he's ready to be painted. And I know it took a moment, maybe about two or three minutes to loop all of this out. But now that I have that done, all I need to do is just go to my, say my paintbrush with this ridiculously large nib right here and just do that, make sure I get everything. And then deselect it. And now I have a matte layer in back of my character. But now I can group both of these together so they travel together no matter where they go. So just on the uh, above the line art layer, I'm going to create a group layer right here. And I'm going to rename my group layer. I'm going to call it boy. Oops. Um, one thing word to the wise. Um, which I should have taken account of, uh, is that, you know, there are sometimes some glitches that can happen in Sketchbook Pro and any program really. Uh, but this is one of them. If you make a group layer and you name it immediately, it will spaz out and grab the layer that's like two layers down and, you know, throw it in there for some reason. So what you're gonna wanna do is just simply tap on make a group folder and go to the first layer that you want, which is the line art, and then hold down shift and select the layer below it, which is the color uh, mat. And I'm going to click and drag on the reorder, the first one on the top layer of the line art. I'm gonna click and drag it into the center of the group folder area, which is going to make it a successful, um, you know, grouping. Uh, if I do it any other way, it's going to not just not work, it's gonna, again, it's gonna knock them all the way to the bottom of the, the stack in order. So let me try it. And that's a successful grouping. And so I can collapse it and turn it on and off. And I can also color code them. I say, I'm gonna make this blue. And if I open up the layer again, the folder, now both layers by extension have also been labeled blue. And so there you go. Um, that was adding a bit of color. Uh, and if you wanted to take this beyond just the storyboard and you know, uh, standpoint, you could start playing around with these colors and you know, uh, get all fancy with it and start coloring your character on your matte layer. Because if I'm in my matte layer, like right here on the white, I could easily bring down this nib and just start coloring in, say for instance, his hair. Or 
I could find a skin tone color and start coloring in the rest of him. And that's pretty much how all digital art layers work. They may all have different bells and whistles that make them uh, make them go, but they all pretty much have the same basic look or functions to the interface that was set down by, um, you know, Photoshop way back in the day. If I want to be able to sample, like say for instance, this distinct color for the hair or the skin, all I have to do is hold and, and you can see but when I hold down on I, I get an icon of an ink dropper. And so when I tap on it, now you can see that color is selected now. And so now I can continue to color the rest of the hair. So that's about that. And so in the next video, what I'm gonna uh, delve into with you guys is that I'm gonna add a background in back of this character. And then we're gonna add some extra poses. Uh, some of them are gonna have what we call in the animation industry as anticipation, which shows a character going from the transition pose of showing one, uh, one pose moving into the next pose. So um, that's about it for now. Um, I hope you learned a lot about um, Sketchbook Pro uh, and I can't wait to show you guys some more. So um, happy hunting in your drawing uh, quest and uh, I hope you have a good weekend. All right, bye-bye.